the Egyptologists and actually the Kemetologists uh, that were there, Kemet being the original name of Egypt. And so there's a new field that's developing called Kemetology that are not, at, they're the archaeologists and Egyptologists that don't adhere to the, um, to the classical mainstream view of, um, of, uh, of Egypt and are making much more sensible um, evaluation of what happened there. And it was so heartwarming to see them talk about this, you know, talking about how this must have been, like certain parts of Egypt, certain temples, certain things in the temple are from dynastic Egypt, of course, but that dynastic Egypt built on what was already there, which was these megalithic structures that were already present from an earlier civilization, which they describe in their text, describe in the hieroglyphs that you find all over the temples. They talk about that earlier civilization. They talk about the sun gods uh, being there and, and, and them learning from them and all this stuff. The, you know, it was really heartwarming to see that this is becoming more and more actually acceptable in Egypt amongst archaeologists and anthropologists and, and, uh, and Egyptologists, and that chemitology is actually taking, you know, um, uh, is taking its hold. And, mm. and uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just straight up data. It's just straight up facts. It's not people coming up with crazy stuff. In fact, you know, it is the standard view that's omitting a lot of facts in order to maintain their story about what happened in Egypt. And these facts are non-trivial facts, like thousand ton statues. That just doesn't get done. It doesn't matter how many slaves you got. It doesn't matter how many wine ropes you got. And if you got only copper tools to cut these stones, you're not cutting the pink granite into like perfectly polished surfaces on thousand ton blocks, you just not. You know, the obelisks, uh, the, the, the obelisks, I mean, literally, when you arrive in Aswan uh, Quarry, at the Where pink you? Uh, granite quarry in Aswan, um, you get to sit in front of a video produced by National Geographic showing archaeologists, mostly Zaya Was, talking about how you know uh, 170 men uh, with like durite rocks were just knocking at the granite you know to hew these incredible obelisks and, and he's even talking about how you know people came from all around africa to come and do this and you know and it was like a great celebration to come and cut stone in the quarry in 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 um in uh in aswan um and they they found remaining remains of beer and so they talk about how they just drank beer yeah there's the obelisk yeah that there you go that's the uh, that is the unfinished obelisk in the quarry in aswan in the pink granite quarry in aswan look at this thing it's massive something feet long i think they said yeah it's a thousand ton obelisk if it would have been finished and used out of there how do you pull that out a thousand ton like this i mean it just doesn't what do you, uh, what do you make of all this scooping marks because they're very right. consistent they're looking they look like it was soft and scooped and we talked about the possibility of the rock having been softened that's in some way in order to actually do this kind of cutting and quarrying yeah yeah i mean on the side as well you can see the scooping yeah, yeah the scooping is very strange um it's it's hard to comprehend how it was done um you know there is um because it's not just on top it's on the side you can see like very clear like scooping yeah, yeah. marks yeah, on yeah. the side um and uh, 
you know, um, and, and, and then not only on the side, but underneath as well. So, so you know, whatever was scooping was not able to not just do a, a linear motion through the side of the obelisk, but was able to go underneath as well and remove material. And, um, you know, and, and, and not only underneath, like on the bottom of the underneath, but underneath the obelisk itself. So, so if you're doing this with a granite rock, you know, knock, 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 which, you know, we had, we had uh, duride rocks there and we tried to break the granite with the duride rocks and it was just, it just, yeah, it wasn't happening. But, um, but you would be upside down trying to knock a, like a fairly heavy stone, you know, upwards, you know, to produce the effect it would be completely unfeasible. Um, but, but that, so, so people say, well, you talk about how it was not done. So how was it done, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, well, okay. Well, you know, clearly, um, Clearly, and, and you know, these obelisks would have to be moved away from the enclosure from which they're cut, and they would have to be lifted out of there. <laughs> and then they have to go down the hill, and then they have to go up another hill, and down another hill before they get to the Nile, and somehow load it on a barge on the Nile. So, how do you load a thousand ton block on a barge? It's beyond me. And, and then, not uh, and, yeah, and not capsize the whole thing. But um, you know, again, to lift a thousand ton block in modern era, we talk, we're talking about serious engineering. You're talking months of engineering to uh, huge trucks load coming with very large pieces of a bridge crane. And then the pieces of the bridge crane being assembled on rails, like this is an immense operation. And then maybe you can pick it up and move it a few feet. And then you'd have to drop it, disassemble the whole thing, right? Remove all the tracking, redo all the engineering for another lift, re-put all the bridge crane back together, and then lift it and move it another, you know, few feet. Like maybe 50 feet, maybe 100 feet. Um, and, and then do that over and over again. And you can't do that on rough terrain, it would have to be leveled. So um, anyway, so how was it done? You can see the scooping there. So my feeling, and it, it comes from not just feelings, but from science that I do, um, is that, and, and the archeologists there agreed with me, gravity control, what they called anti-gravity, which I, I don't like the term because anti-gravity would be like saying like anti-light is darkness or whatever. It's not anti-gravity, it's gravity control. Um, but, but gravity control must have been involved for some of these placements of these stones, for some of the movements of these stones. And what I think is that actually when you put the uh, energetic beam onto the rock, the rock becomes so ionized, it becomes almost in a state of plasma. And I know this sounds really out there, but like I assure you, you have to think completely outside the box to be able to account for what is in Egypt and what you can find there. And so, um, you know, this is, um, this is very powerful um, evidence. And so you have to come up with very powerful tools to produce this evidence. And so um, when you put the gravitational energetic beam on the rock, the rock most likely ionized to a state in which is more like a soft potty, right? And, and at that point, it's malleable. Not only is it able to be lifted because you're changing the local gravitational uh, force that are applied onto the rock, but as well, when the rock is placed in this position, it can be shaped, it can be smoothed out, it can be 
adapted to the local rock. So you see that in the temple. Uh, I wanted to show some of those pictures, but you know, some of the rocks are, are fitted so precisely that you can see they are fused together. Um, so you would get those kind of effects from rock that's in a plasma state. Um, so not, a, not, of course, not a plasma gas or, or a plasma liquid, but a, but a, plas like a, a state like where the rock is almost like potty, you know? Um, and, um, and so you could see as well those scooping marks could come from the rock being in that soft state where you could have a device that's scooping the material from the side of the rock um, and so on while the rock is in that state. Of course, uh, you know, the energy level in order to do that or something we don't, pos we don't have right now that, you know, our modern era does not have right now. But consider this, our modern era has only 150 to 200 years of modern, um, you know, mechanical and technological development. Before that, it was horse and buggy. Um, so, you know, in 150 years, we've advanced quite a bit. Like, think uh, even in, in the last 50 years, what computers transformation have gone through, um, you know? Uh, it's it's remarkable. Um, I have pictures of of a hard drive being pulled out of IBM in I think the seventies, and it's a few megabytes hard drive, and it takes a semi truck to put it on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now in days in the in a micro SD chip, we can have gigabytes. Uh, you know, in a, in something that's so small, it's easy to lose. Um, so. Uh, you know, imagine a civilization that was prior to our last cataclysmic era. Uh, so that's why the cataclysmologists are calling it pre-cataclysmic uh, society, pre-cataclysmic time, um, and that had maybe thousands of years of evolution uh, in in an evolution that might have been quite different from ours, um, and. As well, imagine people from other parts of our galaxy that might have come along because they're very advanced and they're able to travel across the galaxy. That is not so unreasonable when we consider that in our galaxy alone, there is possibility for planetary systems that are in the same dimension and the same uh, placement as the Earth for life relative to their star. It, the, the probabilities are in the excess of four, um, 40 billion in our galaxy alone. So there might be societies there that are much more advanced than us and that have been able to come to our planet a very long time ago. And there's a lot of evidence of that in ancient civilization texts and traditions and, and, um, and folklore talking about people, and especially in Egypt, talking about people that came in floating boats and, you know, sun gods that could do all kinds of things that, um, you know, the Egyptian described, but nowhere in Egypt, nowhere in Egypt or in any Egyptian text does it say that they actually did these things, that they, you know, oh, by the way, this is how we built the pyramids. This is how we moved thousand ton blocks. This is... Nowhere does it say that, you know, in any shape or form. What they say is that the sun gods did these things, um, that they were witness to the sun gods doing these things, that they helped the sun gods do these things, that they were uh, having an interaction with people that had boats that could float in the air and so on. I mean, when I say boats, they were depicting, you know, um, a barge, boats, because that was the way to depict a ship, you know, a device, a, some kind of device that you could be in or stand on that in, in to, to say and to show them floating in the air 
you know, clearly describe something that had gravity control capability and so on. So, you know, the chemitologists were not necessarily going that far in their interpretation, but they were open to the possibility.